to PA Centered, a podcast designed to help listeners be a part of the solution to end sexual harassment, abuse, and assault. Each episode, we will take on a topic or current event to help spark conversation and break down barriers to building communities free from sexual violence. I'm Jim Wilshire, the Chief Public Affairs Officer for PCAR, and we're recognizing the start of Black History Month this February. We know it's important to learn and talk about racial justice and Black history throughout the year. PCAR strives to be an actively anti-racist organization, which means recognizing that our culture has historically erased many of the contributions of people of color. Our PA-centered podcast is just one of the ways we're looking to shine a light on the many untold or underappreciated accomplishments achieved by people of color. This month, we're celebrating two important Black leaders in Pennsylvania's legislature that are making history every day, Representative Donna Bullock and Representative Joanne McClinton. Representative McClinton will join us on our February 24th episode. Today, we're joined by Representative Bullock, who has served as a member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives since 2015, representing the 195th Legislative District, which includes parts of North and West Philadelphia. Representative Bullock is an attorney, a mother, a wife, and a tireless public servant who is committed to supporting working families through legislative initiatives that fund public education, create jobs, build healthy, sustainable communities. She's an advocate for equal pay and increased minimum wage, clean energy and environmental justice, quality public schools and pre-K education, and sustainable community development. Representative Bullock, thanks for taking time to join us today. Thank you for having me, Joe. So we're excited to get started, and, and thank you for all the things that you do do in the, the Pennsylvania House, and we want to take some time to, to learn about you, as well as a lot of the accomplishments that are happening in the House. Um, what inspired you when you were growing up? I think like most people, uh, the person that inspired me was someone in my family, my grandmother. Uh, my mother, grandmother, and I lived together for most of my early childhood. And we had some struggles along the way. You know, my grandfather passed um, and my mother and grandmother were trying to help uh, to make ends meet. And so part of making ends meet meant we had to visit a local soup kitchen in my hometown in New Jersey um, to receive meals. But what my grandmother always told me was that no matter how small I was or how little I have, that I can give back. And so after I ate my meal at the soup kitchen, she required that I also volunteered as she did. And so whether it was washing dishes or helping a senior get their plate or sweeping up after the meal, I had to contribute to the operation of the soup kitchen. Um, and what she told me is just that, that no matter how small you are, no matter how little you have, and even though my family was struggling at that time, we found a way to give back to our community. And it is a message that I've carried with me through college, through law school, and now as a public servant, that I can, you know, also give back to others. And so now that, um, you know, whether it's the skills that I've learned in college or my law degree, working in community services, legal services, I've always wanted to be a contributing uh, member of society and definitely giving back everything I have to my community. And so my grandmother inspired me growing up. Oh, that, that's, that's a great story. It sounds like that that's a, a legacy that, that she was starting and, and you're, you're picking up from there. What do, what do you want the, the legacy for you to be as the, the next generation is coming behind you also? You know, it's a great question because I think it follows just that. I hope that my children, the two boys that I brought into this world, understands that they have an obligation and responsibility to give back to their community as well. I mean, I think my biggest legacy is those two individuals and who I leave in this on this planet and, and their contributions to society. Um, beyond my personal contribution of hopefully would be two outstanding citizens. Right now they're just two uh, annoying adolescent teenagers. Um, but when you know outside of their work, I hope that folks will look back and say, you know, Representative Bullock cared about her community. Um, she put community and her family first. And, uh, and those, those, those two things matter more to me than anything, my family and the community in which I'm in. Um, and so I try my hardest to, to uh, be, you know, um, a great mother and a wife, a daughter, and, uh, you know, but also a great citizen. 
um, and realizing that, the, you know, my family extends beyond those who live in my household. It is, in fact, the folks who live on my block, and it is the folks who I'm seeing in the grocery stores, and how can I help make their lives a little better? What can I do to improve somebody else's situation? Um, and if, if it's in my power to do so, that I didn't hesitate to do it, that I didn't, you know, just say no, like I made a way to, to be helpful to others whenever it was possible. And so that, that, that would definitely be my legacy. That's a, that's a great one. Uh, what, what are the, the challenges that you, you face personally trying to, to lead all of that? I, I think you're going to hear a theme here and that is family, right? Some of the biggest challenges for anyone who's in public service is balancing life and balancing their demands of uh, being in public service and being a leader with your obligations to your to your own family, making sure you don't ignore um, the needs of your children and, and of your the elder folks in your in your family and others. And so I I find that to often be that challenge, making sure that I prioritize and pay attention to the needs of my children, um, that my mother is taken care of, and that I'm doing everything I can I can and should be doing for them. And balancing some of that uh, personal time, right? Because uh, you got to take care of yourself. Uh, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't do for others. You can't take care of your loved ones. And you surely can't put yourself out there in the public space trying to, to lead and be um, a leader for your community. It will, it will really tear you apart and break you down. So you must, must take care of yourself. And it's one of the challenges I've had every year, just checking in on myself and saying, you know, Donna, are you taking care of your mental health and your well-being? Did you go see the dentist this year? Did you go see the, you know, your eye doctor and all those other things so that you can be a healthy, uh, well, you know, uh, and well-balanced person and leader for your community? Um, and that's important. You're absolutely right. And that's that's one of the themes for what we've been living for the last two years. So it's great that you're, you're leading by example for that, too, on top of everything else. One of the other things we, we wanted to talk to you more about is that you are chair of the, the Legislative Black Caucus. And, and we wanted to talk about that more um, for those of us that that are that are listening and looking to learn. Before we get into that, can you can you help everyone in our audience understand a little bit about what a le legislative caucus is and, and what they do? Sure. So within the Pennsylvania General Assembly, you have different groups or organizations of legislators who um, connect based on a shared interest. Um, and that interest sometimes may be regional. We all live in Philadelphia or in the Southeast region of the state or in Allegheny County. And so there may be some shared interest in that space. Others have other shared interests. Maybe you wanna all advance opportunities or promote early childhood education, or um, even if you support the Second Amendment, there's a Second Amendment caucus. There's sort of easier way to explain it. It's a club, but with a legislative purpose, a goal. So there's a group of us that get together to work on those legislative um, priorities that we share. And so the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus is one of the oldest legislative caucuses that uh, remains in the house and most consistent in that the work that it does and it's definitely recognized um, for the uh, the accomplishments and and weight that it carries in the legislature you know we represent the uh, around 30 uh, members of color who who represent the interests of not just black communities but all communities of color in Pennsylvania and then beyond that so while we have in our caucus that identify as a person of color, we also extend associate membership to members who do not identify as a person of color, but represent uh, communities of color. So maybe you live in a, a part of Pennsylvania and you represent that particular area um, and you have a, a significant population of color that you wanna make sure you address those issues and understand what, what issues are important to black and brown communities in Pennsylvania. We invite those legislators to participate in our meetings, to understand our priorities as, as black, uh, black and brown members of the General Assembly so that you can more effectively represent those Pennsylvanians and vote on issues that matter to them. So the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus is focused on supporting first and foremost those members who identify as black and brown, 
but also making sure that we elevate the issues that are important to black and brown Pennsylvanians right here in the capital, um, in our state capital in Harrisburg. And I, I feel like we, we have to note that the, the caucus has been around for, for quite a while. It's about to celebrate a milestone of, of 50 years. Is that right? Yes, it was started in the early 70s um, with the members there. And, and, and maybe a little bit before then, we hear some um, conversations or we read some notes that it may have started in the late 60s, but most of the members at the time were meeting in secret um, before they became a, a, an established caucus within the General Assembly. But they were meeting in secret because uh, there was such a small number of uh, Black members in the General Assembly at the time. That number has grown. As I mentioned, we are uh, close to 30 and we have a couple of associate members as well. And we are also more diverse in the region, right? We have members from not just Philadelphia, but from Pittsburgh and in the middle of the state like uh, York and in Berks. And, in, and we are you know, showing that Pennsylvanians of color are all throughout the Commonwealth. And so um, that diversity and representation has really helped us shape policy in the General Assembly and helped us um, raise the issues that are important to all Pennsylvanians. Um, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that when we have a diverse ex uh, representation of experience, values uh, at the General Assembly, we all benefit from that. Uh, one of the lines I've talked about often uh, is that when I first started the General Assembly, in 2015, I was one of nine black women uh, to be elected to the General Assembly. Of the 253 members, that's including the Senate and the House, there was only nine black women. But at the time there were, Jim, get this, 13 white guys named Mike, right? So it was this, this like kind of interesting fact, but it helped illustrate the need for more diversity. And some, some of those white guys named Mike are really, great guys and I've enjoyed working with them and passing legis and working on legislation that I thought improved the lives of Pennsylvanians and moved our commonwealth forward. But there is a point here that we need to have more diversity in the house to raise issues like equal pay and raise issues like maternal health well uh, uh, and wellness, which was something the um, mm -hmm. many of the black women have raised here in the commonwealth. Those issues may not have been raised if you didn't have women um, a growing sector in, in the General Assembly, or and particularly women of color representing Pennsylvanians. And I know there, there's a lot that, that you're working on personally, as well as with the with the caucus. Are there some some policies that are you know, in in the works right now that are are being proposed to make Pennsylvania better to meet those missions? Yeah, great question. You know, after uh, the, the last two years of a pandemic and um, and racial and social um, unrest in this country and realizing the disparities uh, in healthcare and the inequities in education and access to broadband and, and wireless and, health, and all of those um, issues that we have read about, we have heard about over the last few years has only elevated the work that many of the members of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus have already been working on. Uh, we continuously look at how we can um, close the gaps and or um, address inequities in healthcare, in education, in criminal justice spaces. And so that work continues, but also um, looking at other work like environmental justice and police reform and prison reform. Uh, this year, some of us are looking at how do we address gun violence as a public health crisis as it disproportionately impacts our communities and has seen some sharp increases during the pandemic. Uh, how do we get resources into those communities that are addressing gun violence with evidence-based uh, community-based uh, strategies? And uh, how do we address things like traffic stops and racial profiling. Uh, I have a bill or an amendment to a bill um, that will uh, require our local law enforcement agencies to record or, or maintain data of who they're stopping and why they're stopping those individuals. Do, who gets a citation? Who gets a warning? Whose car is searched? And are there any um, trends or concerns there that we need to address with additional training or resources so that we can have um, you know, better law enforcement in our communities. 
so these are some of the things that we're looking at um, and the, those issues will continue to be raised by the members of the Black Caucus. But it's important to know that we're also looking at things like uh, voting in democracy, particularly now as we look at number of voter, uh, voter election reform bills um, and the redistricting efforts that are happening in our Commonwealth right now. We wanna make sure that voices of black and brown voters are not uh, diminished or diluted through any of these bills or the process of redistricting. And so those are definitely right now some of the priority issues that myself and my colleagues in the Black Caucus are looking at. And one of the, the themes that, that I heard was some of what you said was, was equity. And I know that that's one area in particular, you've had a couple of bills that you've been leading in the House. Um, one was a proposal to create a joint legislative equity committee um, for the Office of Health Equity within the Department of Health. Those are important steps and they, they provide a lot, a lot more equity and um, progress towards getting equity in Pennsylvania. What do you think some of that means for Pennsylvania since health was one of those areas that you were talking about for, for needing equity? Right, and let's also note before we get into that question that this year's theme for Black History Month is actually health and wellness in the Black community. And so as we come out of this pandemic and continue to um, adjust our lives to uh, public health crisis across the, the world, actually, we, we had some lessons, hopefully lessons learned, right? That we need to distribute resources and services to our communities, in particular, our more vulnerable communities in a better way. Um, and we need to make sure that um, those most vulnerable communities are not left out of uh, the process for receiving not you know healthcare generally, but specifically during a pandemic, receiving testing and vaccines. And um, we know that the social determinants of health disproportionately impacted those communities and how they responded to the pandemic and whether or not um, they were hospitalized or unfortunately lost their life to the COVID-19 virus. And so when we look at those things and we look at legislation, I, th I thought it was very important that we have a um, sort of a foundation of what equity means and what, and what are we looking for in legislation going forward and policies going forward. If we want to address the years and generations of historic inequities and racism, we have to strategically invest in a process and a system that restores or creates the equity that we all want. And so I, one of those things I believed was creating a office for to provide equity impact statements. So as legislators, when we are considering a bill, we usually send those bills to an office that gives us a fiscal impact. How does this bill impact our state's finances? How does this bill impact our state's budget? I believe we need a similar office and process that will give us a sense as legislators how our bill impacts people. How does it um, disproportionately or not disproportionately impact different groups of people? And those are what I'm calling equity impact statements. It's not just about how we impact the dollars, it's about how we impact and affect the lives of Pennsylvanians across this uh, Commonwealth every single day when we pass legislation or policy. And so those are the things that I'm focusing on and hopefully we will get some movement on a bill like that that I believe will make um, us a better legislative body and, and hopefully produce better bills um, for all Pennsylvanians that don't create or perpetuate um, the systemic um, inequities that we have talked about over the last two years. Thank you. And with, with some of what you're saying and how important health is too, us being the, the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape, um, sexual violence is one of the things we're seeking to end. And we know that oppression and racism are deeply rooted in, in sexual violence also. It, when, when you're working to try to make things more equitable and you're, you're looking to give a voice to a lot of the, the communities that you're representing, both yourself as well as with the caucus, you know, what, what do you have as a, as a vision for Pennsylvania 10 years from now in being more diverse and inclusive, especially for helping to try to end things like sexual violence is, is something that's a result of that? Right. When we want to address issues like sexual violence, reproductive health, equity pay, 
equal pay, racial profiling, or any of those issues that impact specific groups and demographics, we need to have a more reflective and, and representative democracy. And so when I look at the legislature 10 years from now, what I'm hoping is that I'm not having a conversation about there being nine black women and 13 white guys named Mike. We're already working towards that. So yes, we still only have nine black women in the state uh, general assembly, but we're chopping away at the white guys named Mike. Not, I don't know there are 13, but I think there are about six or seven. I haven't gotten the latest count. And there are other examples of diversity. We have two openly gay men um, in the house now. We have folks representing all corners of the Commonwealth, folks um, who have acknowledged or, or shared that they have um, you know, certain learning uh, challenges or, or that they um, may have other uh, disabilities that they are willing to share with us. Folks who acknowledge that they are going through um, certain mental health experiences. And, and when we share those, those experiences and the, those, um, you, you know, I, in some way identifying markers about ourselves, we help create a more inclusive commonwealth. Now, when we talk about sometimes even increasing the minimum wage, it can be a challenge for a group that is homogeneously male, homogeneously white, and maybe from um, middle class and upper middle class to understand that minimum wage workers are in fact adults, not ch children or teenagers trying to earn a few dollars after school that they are folks, mostly women, um, trying to provide for their families, not women trying to earn a couple dollars so they can have some spending money. The, you know, these are things that I've heard, but when you bring more women to the floor of the House and the floor of the Senate, when you bring more people from diverse economic backgrounds um, whose families may have relied on a minimum wage or may have relied on public benefits to get by. When you bring those diverse experiences to the House and the floor, House floor and the Senate floor, then we're able to have honest conversations about who the real minimum wage workers are. We're, we're able to have honest conversations about who needs access to health care and what types of health care do they need access to. We can have real conversations about. Uh, the lack of access to broadband and why it's necessary not just to, um, you know, watch uh, or stream your favorite video, but to also get health care or to go to school now or apply for a job and participate in a job interview. We are using the internet and wireless services and broadband for so much more now, and we need to make sure that everyone has access to that. There's so many, so many issues that can be um, addressed with a more, a, a fuller picture, a, a, a more input from more uh, Pennsylvanians if we had a more diverse legislature. And so when I have this vision for Pennsylvania 10 years from now, we are in fact more diverse, more inclusive and representative of, of the Commonwealth. And maybe we, we have more than nine black women serving. We have, you know, um, more other uh, people of color serving. We have more LGBTQ people serving. We have people who may identify as having different disabilities serving and that diversity helps create a better Commonwealth. That's my vision. And that sounds like a great one. Um, for, for everyone that, that's listening, you know, what, what, are, what are steps that you know, all of us can do? Taking steps even outside of, of policy and some of the legislative work that you're doing now, what are the things that, that we can do to try to help make things uh, more equitable for, for our fellow Pennsylvanians? Wow, you know, we all can play a different role, um, engage at different levels. First and foremost, I, I would say step a little bit out of your comfort level, right? And, and that may mean listening, that's just key, listening to different groups of people, putting, attending community meetings, uh, attending um, different panel discussions where you can hear and learn from others who may not share the same experiences and, 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 and values as you. And to, to let others take the lead sometimes um, and recognize that 
their leadership is just as valuable as, as yours in that space. And I would say, lastly, recognize the privilege we all have to do whatever it is that you're doing. I often say that when I'm at a meeting or I'm taking some time in the middle of the day to attend a town watch community meeting or some other thing, some other space where I'm speaking, I acknowledge that I had the privilege and the time to do that because there's somebody who didn't, somebody who had to work that day, somebody who had to care for an, uh, a, a, an elder or sick loved one, somebody who had to take care of their children and could not make it to the community meeting, could not run for office because of the demands on their life, did not have access to the spaces that I have access to. And so when I'm in those spaces, for whatever reason and whatever um, vehicle that got me there, I, I have this obligation to speak for those who weren't there I wanna say speak for those, but make sure that in some way their voices are heard. And so if I can share their stories, give them the information that they need and understand the, the, the burden or responsibility that I have with their voice, not just when I go to Harrisburg, but also when I just go to the community meeting down the block from my house, um, that, that that's part of it to make sure everybody is heard in that space. And for you to do that, for you to adequately represent somebody else's voice, it requires you to do what I said first, which is listen, listen to them. So that would be my tip and advice as we, you know, not just recognize equity and moving forward, but just, you know, recognize each other as everyone is a human, human beings all in the same planet trying to survive. And we just need to treat each other uh, with the, you know, respect. Yeah, that that's a great answer. Thank you. And I, I know when we started, you said that, um, your grandmother is the one that, that inspired you. And I can hear some, some of what was probably really great advice that got imparted to you and has developed into the leader you are today. So I'm sure that you've definitely made her proud. And, and we definitely thank you for all that, that you do and everything that the, the caucus has done for Pennsylvania also. Thank you, Jim. And I really enjoyed our conversation today. Um, yes, you know, my grandmother was special to me, and I'm sure we all have a, a grandmom or an abuelita or a pop pop or somebody who has been impactful in your life. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just really appreciative of the lessons that she taught me with very little that she had. Um, and I hope that I make her proud, and I hope that we can carry, I can carry that on to my children and everyone else that I have. Um, you know, contact with every single day. It's that kind of legacy, that history that we all recognize, not just during Black History Month, but throughout the year, that's what makes um, our Commonwealth such a special place. I, I completely agree. So thank you for your time. And that's all we have for this episode of Pennsylvania Centered. Tune in on February 24th for our next interview with Representative Joanne McClinton as Democratic floor leader in the House. And we'll catch up on past episodes to learn more about how you can help in sexual harassment, abuse, and assault. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you or a loved one needs help, a local sexual assault center is available 24-7. Call 1-888-772-7227 for more information or find your local center online at pcar.org. Together, we can end sexual violence. Any views or opinions expressed on PA Centered by staff or their guests are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of PCAR or PCAR's funders.